The following is a live broadcast of a Lone Star Community Radio program. Recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Connors FM 104.5, 106.1, and Facebook.com slash IRLoneStar. For more information on this show, please visit our show page at IRLoneStar.com slash shows. To sponsor or donate to this program, visit our donate page at IRLoneStar.com slash donate. Or email us at lscrstudios at gmail.com or give us a call at 936-666-1084. Lone Star Community Radio production and broadcast is possible by folks like you. So sponsor and donate today. You're listening to Lone Star Community Radio on 104.5 KCZW LP Conroe and 106.1 KCCZ LP Conroe and worldwide at IRLoneStar.com. Welcome to The Legal Connection with Tony and Cheryl. Uh, Tony Lynn Collins, Tony Sherritz Collins, and Cheryl ellsworth Jahani. We are two Texas licensed attorneys, and we are here on 104.5 and 106.1 FM uh, in Conroe, Texas. Montgomery County is what we cover, and I think some of Harris County. Um, hopefully a lot of Harris County. We're here every Tuesday from 12 to 1, and we're talking we about... We cover the world. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> we're on the internet. That's well, that's true. <laughs> and you can watch us live on Facebook right now if yes. you want. And you can watch us later on mm-hmm. Facebook if you want. Mm-hmm. But we're here every Tuesday from twelve to one, and we have been talking about Second Amendment rights, which is a right to bear arms. Mm-hmm. We've been talking about uh, the Stand Your Ground law or the Castle Doctrine, and, and how some. that affects us right now with all the protests going on in the St. Louis couple, and when uh, you, when when you can carry arms and when you can't, and when you can't can and cannot defend yourself and what the consequences are if you do right Mm -hmm. so guns and then also uh we want to get to homeowners associations and how they can even restrict your uh second amendment rights even more to protect yourself and if you put people on notice there's there's a lot of rules and so we're going to go over that briefly because we had that in my own homeowners association where there was an issue with uh during all this protesting and uh, uh, you know, a lot of the Black Lives Matters and what have you, uh, one of our neighbors uh, was uh, basically assaulted, and so they put signs up, and now the homeowners assaulted association... Assaulted in her driveway. Right, right, in her driveway. Followed they followed her people. home. And so people be careful of that, too. You just don't know. Mm-hmm. Be aware of your surroundings. She was, and what really saved her was that they had big dogs, and the dogs came out when these people were trying to basically... Uh, assault uh, and, and rob her. Yeah. So and they put signs up to warn them in the future uh, as they didn't have to put the signns up. Now they're letting them know, shoot, trespassably shot on site. So although it seems harsh, it's the truth and they've right. let them know. Right. And, uh, but the Homeowners Association is, is balking about it saying, well, you're bringing down our home values, which is just absurd because they've got like a, a house that's beyond, uh, you know, uh, the sky's the limit of its value. So it's, we, we we love them as neighbors. We if they want to put signs up and keep that gorgeous house there and yeah, <laughs> like put the signs right. up. Absolutely. I don't think that's evaluating our property. I think it's for, it's probably protecting the values of our property. But yeah. we're gonna get into that a little bit and what some of the rules are on that. So well, so first let's talk about stand your ground law, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so last time we talked about Second Amendment, right to bear arms, stand your ground. Stand your ground law, sometimes it's called a line in the sand or no duty to retreat, Mm -hmm. provides that people may use lethal force to defend themselves or others, right to self-defense against threats, (coughs) excuse me, or reasonably perceived threats, regardless of whether they can safely retreat from the situation. Under such a law, people have no duty to retreat from any place where they have a lawful right to be and may use any necessary force if they reasonably believe they are in imminent danger of death, serious bodily harm, kidnapping, rape, or in some jurisdictions, robbery, or some other serious crime. And that's really um, <coughs> where, you know, the, uh, uh, I guess, the, the, what do you call the rubber hits the road, because what is reasonable, and there's so many cases that have come up, and there was a really important, uh, uh, I guess, a, a uh, president set, presidential setting president setting case here in Harris precedent, County president right. setting case well, where, where there was a guy that and you hear about these things all the time but one right. that was in Harris County and it was like about uh, I want to say maybe 15 20 years ago mm-hmm. where this guy was uh, 
protecting his property and someone uh, a a person in the street was killed and there was a question of whether or not stand your ground uh, could apply there and I believe um, ultimately he was convicted so you can't just assume stand your ground is going to protect you even if everything supports that that you were just protecting your property or you felt threatened because, because they felt like it was unreasonable they His felt like it was unreasonable, unreasonable because they didn't there he wasn't under enough danger for that to be reasonable even if it was in his mind that it was and that that goes toward the and you know on a printout on it but that goes toward what happened with the the st louis couple that's been charged with um i think um the, the two attorneys, one was 61, one was 63. They were... What the, were they charged with? Um, uh, weapon... Possession of... Um, oh, I can't remember. I've got a, I've got a, an article on it somewhere. But basically, they were charged with the felony offense, and it had to do with them uh, brandishing weapons in their front yard to protect themselves during the protest when the Black Lives Matter protest came through their gated community and threatened them. And so it's a, a lot of the facts haven't come out yet, but um, they he would know his rights better than anyone else. He's a criminal defense attorney. Right. He said he did, it wasn't prejudice. He represents all kinds of clients sure. of every different color and national origin. Of course. And so why um, why were they coming after him? Well, they have a liberal mayor, apparently, and a DA, and they charged them with, um, with the felony for being in the front yard. Um, with a gun with a gun and so uh the same thing and we're going to go over uh with a little bit more depth of what happened recently in austin and it was when did on, that happen tony uh the austin incident mm -hmm. the austin incident occurred on oh, what day was it july it says july 30th july 30th it was very uh, recent that well this happened. you want to talk about that now since we well, were just talking about the st louis um, couple yeah and then we can go over uh, a, 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 like a, a kind of a question a scenario on what if what do you think would happen and find out how you feel about that and or, or what our listeners believe without answering the question like you would legally analyze it okay, okay. so what kind of piqued my interest was not only that my neighbors during this recent you know the protesting with all of these these uh, cities that are pretty much letting people uh, uh, not socially distance and dem mm -hmm. demonstrate, mm -hmm. but not peaceably because they're burning buildings and they're brandishing arms and they're they're creating problems. They're not just like a Martin Luther King march. They're not just marching to make their statement. They're not even saying what they're what they really want. They're making unreasonable requests like reparations for Black people, uh, you know, uh, relatives or, or descendants from somebody that could have been. Uh, a slave, you know, uh, 200 years ago, or whatever it might be. So their their request don't seem to be in line with what they're doing. Their their actions don't support what they're what they're saying they're protesting for. Right. And so, um, what happened recently in Austin? And I'm going to just kind of uh, paraphrase. This was July 30th, so it was like three or four days. Very ago. very recent, mm -hmm. and it's just surprising that something like this could happen in Austin because we're. You know, we're, we're more level-headed. We like our guns in Texas, but, but certainly we're not starting a chop city and we're not, you know, uh, you're not killing each other within a city or whatever. Um, my daughter lives in Austin. My son uh, does. My, uh, my best friends went to school in Austin. I went to Austin all the time. Right. My, some of Mine my too. very good friends now live in amazing houses in mm -hmm. the, the hill country in Austin. Mine too. Uh, so there, you wouldn't think that something like this would happen here, but it did. And so if, I, I didn't hear this on the news, but maybe you did. And if you didn't, we're going to go over it. I didn't. Um, this was, uh, I forgot what I was listening to, but, but it came up and I was just stunned. Okay, so... Um, Austin police, uh, this is from the Texas Tribune. The Austin police are investigating the fatal shooting of an armed 28-year-old. In fact, I think I like this article better. It kind of gets more to the point, and it's one from a, a, a television station in, in Austin, and they have recapped it here. It kind of gets more to the point. Um, Garrett Foster was seen carrying an AK-47 rifle at a Black Lives Matter protest on July 25th. Oh, okay. A little bit. They were reporting it later. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the same night he was shot. Okay, so the first now AK forty seven is an illegal weapon to uh, possess. I oh, believe. I didn't know that you couldn't carry that. See, I should know oh, no. more about my I gun laws. I think an AR fifteen you can, okay. but an AK forty seven, I believe. Okay, so we're going to hear more about this because yeah. they've analyzed the law in this article. Thank okay. you, uh, reporter, the news reporter that wrote. It. Oh, there was a lot of them. There's like. John Thomas, Avery Travis, Erin Cargill, just a whole slew of people. Uh, I should read all their names so they all get credit. Josh Hinkle, Kevin Clark, Wes Rappaport, uh, Jacqueline Powell, and Erin Cargill. Wow. Um, anyway, this guy went to a, a, quote, peaceful protest for Black Lives Matter, but 
he showed up with an AK-47 rifle. Mm -hmm. And so you're just thinking he's asking for trouble because with guns and Well, that's the reasonableness that comes in. How is that reasonable? Yeah, and I don't know if this is an AK-47 rifle, but I I I don't think we have our video on. But is that... It looks like a handgun to me. I don't think that's an AK-47. AK-47 looks like the one that the guy, the St. Louis couple had. Okay. But I think he had an AR-15. Okay, okay. Okay, so that a 20-year-old, a 28-year-old died at the hospital, and we have kids that age. So that's yeah, pretty scary. That's so terrible. Um, 28-year-old died at the hospital after being shot several times during a confrontation between a motorist and protesters. And, um, you know, if you if you Google uh, Garrett Foster, who was the guy that died, you'll see that he's just um, red-headed, blue-eyed, light-skinned guy, uh, looks just like maybe one of our kids. Okay, mm-hmm. My kids don't have red hair. I think that... My they, sister's kids do. They all have red hair. Okay. So, so maybe... One the, of the, Rachel's kids. Okay. So one yeah. of Rachel's children. Uh-huh. And, um, uh, but he's, po- his Facebook, he's uh, posted next to his wife, who's black. So he was marching in the Black Lives Matter, mm-hmm. I guess, on behalf of his wife, with his wife. I'm not really sure. They don't really mm-hmm. go into it. Anyway, so um, we know that there was an altercation between this guy and a motorist. And so this is what happened. Um, Seconds, it says, it was on Congress Street in um, oh gosh, in Austin. Austin. Okay, it's, very, it's a place where we've all been if sure. you've gone to the courthouse. Uh, seconds later, there was a volley, and I don't know why this is kind of picking up and leaving off where it, it looks kind of odd, but uh, there was a volley of gunfire. Gunshots were fired from inside the vehicle at Mr. Foster. Austin Police Chief uh, Brian Manley said, during the initial investigation of this report, it appears Mr. Foster may have pointed his rifle at the driver of this vehicle prior to being shot. Okay, and that's a he said, she said. So you need, um, you're, you're going to need witnesses for this. And there's a lot. Uh, the driver who says he shot and, fi- and killed Foster revealed the identity, identity later Thursday night in an email from his attorney to news media. The email identified the shooter as Daniel Perry, an active duty soldier with the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood. All right, so we've got a good guy who's representing the United States in a car who's now killed a protester carrying an AK-47 who is a red-headed, blue-eyed, 28-year-old in a protest. So you're just thinking, I don't know who my sympathies go to because I mm-hmm. like both of them already, mm-hmm. right? Uh, both of them are acting crazy, though, because mm-hmm. they've pulled guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, the statement says Perry was driving for a rideshare company when he dropped a client off near Congress Avenue. Uh, so that's why he was there. He was looking for another request for pickup or food delivery when he turned right onto Congress Avenue from 4th Street. Um, that's when he encountered the group of protesters. So here's a guy that's just doing his job. You know, mm-hmm. he's just driving looking through this, for the, next, you know, the next job, right? Mm-hmm. He wasn't looking for trouble. Right. Uh, prior to arriving at the corner of 4th Street in Congress, Sergeant Perry did not know that a demonstration was taking place. I wouldn't have either, you know, going up to Austin. Austin's not the kind of place where I'm thinking there's going to be like a, you know, a heavy protest. Just maybe Dallas, yeah. maybe Houston, but I usually don't think of Austin like that. Yeah. Um, when, particularly because my daughter lives here, it seems unsafe. Uh, Sergeant Perry turned onto Congress Avenue. Several people started beating on his vehicle. An individual carrying an assault rifle, now known to be Garrett Foster, quickly approached the car, then motioned with the assault rifle for Mr. Perry to lower his window, which the attorney says Perry did, thinking the gunman was a police officer. The attorney says Foster then began to raise his weapon, and Perry shot and fired. Perry was ready. I mean, he's a soldier. Perry drove a short distance away to be safety, to be, to, to safe, to safety, while another protester shot at him. So a second protester Holy had a crud. gun. He then called the police. So Garrett called the police. Um, we wait, sim- wait, Garrett or I'm sorry, the driver, Perry. 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 So Perry pulls away to a safe place and then he calls Okay, and he's being shot at again. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, we simply ask that anybody who might want to criticize Sergeant Perry's actions picture themselves trapped in a car as a masked stranger raises an assault rifle in their direction and reflect upon what they might have done if faced with this split-second decision faced by Sergeant Perry that evening. Uh, Manley, and I don't know who Manley is. Manley said, is the comment, the guy who's commenting. Okay. Manley said another um, individual also drew their concealed handgun and fired multiple shots at the car. So we've got all kinds of the Wild West here. Um, both the driver of the vehicle who fired at Foster and the individual who fired at the car later 
on have been released pending further investigation and no charges have been filed. Manley noted that both people have concealed handgun licenses. Texas law... Yeah, but to shoot at people is very different. So he's saying that the shooters at Perry, the driver, uh-huh. uh, weren't charged with anything. They so were far, taken into custody. Okay. Because that's what happened with the St. Louis couple. They didn't initially charge them with anything. They did an investigation. I feel, you know, this is... Okay, maybe I shouldn't be biased. I'll just say that based on the news reports, other reporters have, I, have disclosed their position, and I tend to lean that direction, that... Um, the St. Louis couple were on their property with their guns, and they didn't aim at anybody. That that they probably, going. yeah. But she says that her gun didn't have any ammunition in it. Right. But that's still an, uh, an assault because the people don't know that. Don't know. But they're saying that the other people were yelling at them during this protest, mm-hmm. where everything was being burned down, that they were going to kill them. And so it's a he said she and get said. Get their house and, and live I in their house. If they did it, they they indicted that so quickly. I wonder if that there was a lot, a lot of po- political yeah. involvement in yeah. that because I know that with my grand jury packets, I, it can be months and months because I'm collecting information from experts for months before there's an indictment because that's the proper thing. You're not hot headed. You're simply not having a position on either side. You're just cl- gathering the truth. Um, okay, so Texas law allows for the open carry of long guns like rifles to open carry a handgun someone must carry a valid handgun license texas does not require a person to have a valid license in order to carry a loaded handgun in their motor vehicle if the vehicle is owned if the vehicle is owned by the person or under the person's control however texas generally prohibits intentionally knowingly or recklessly carrying a handgun in plain view in a motor vehicle except in a shoulder our belt holster okay but this sergeant had a, a concealed carry license and so he didn't have to have that in his shoulder or belt holster okay and so when he rolled down his window he was prepared because he just was encountering a protest and he's a in the army and so this all seems to me quite reasonable and on his part that he would want to protect himself in his car and he knew how to handle a gun okay so um but we don't know it could be that it, it isn't like this guy's saying at all mainly i think well it's the fact attorney. that he was shot at shot at after he drove away i think proves that his actions were pretty reasonable if he thought but the person shooting after he drove away may have seen a different thing he may have seen that the first shot came from the, uh, the only shot came from Sergeant Perry, and that they, the uh, the guy with the AK-47 never raised his rifle. So we really don't know. We're only yeah. getting it one-sided. Mm-hmm. But I tend to believe that if you're in the share ride and you're just looking for business and there's a protest and someone is carrying, that just automatically condemns them, unfortunately, an AK-47 during a pre- peaceful march right. that you're asking for trouble. So yeah. if you're going to a peaceful mar- pl- march, please don't bring your AK-47 because it seems like that's just a suicide wish. But... That's just my, you know, looking at the the facts, being a criminal defense attorney. Okay. Texas Gun Sense Board President Ed Scruggs called this shooting, quote, a perfect storm of weak Texas gun laws uh, coming together at that intersection. Um, So he he is obviously in support of not having the Second Amendment because he's complaining about how this was... Uh, the weak gun laws, which I don't agree. I think mm-hmm. we have very good gun laws. I do too. Okay. He argues that at three separate moments in this situation, the presence or use of a gun escalated the situation. I agree an AK-47 mm-hmm. does not comply with our gun mm-hmm. laws, mm-hmm. that that's not a long gun, mm-hmm. and that seemed to me right there, someone should have called the police, mm-hmm. but I don't know if the police were going to arrest him right. under the protest Those situation. Because everyone's afraid right now whenever you've got a big group of people to make an arrest because the police look bad. All mm-hmm. right, And that's one more you know, just ding against the police that shouldn't be there. Mm-hmm. Um, this doesn't involve the motives of people involved in this incident, he said. It's really a case of the atmosphere we are in, promoted by our lax gun laws that make uh, this uh, group, uh, well, my printout doesn't look good. Um, this group is calling for changes. And so I've, I've lost part of the printout, but, but basically he believes there should be changes in law. And I will be the first to say, I totally disagree. I think our laws are fine. I think that the individuals involved here, uh, the person that, if you're going to a protest, leave your guns at home. Right. That's just not appropriate right. to go to a peaceful protest with yeah. a gun. Concealed handgun, maybe, because at the, legally you can do that, but mm-hmm. not an AK-47. That, mm-hmm. And under no circumstances is that even legal to bring mm-hmm. with you to an open protest. Mm-hmm. The founder, and this is going to be the other side of it, the founder of Open Carry Texas, C.J. Grisham, agreed that 
Training was key, but disagreed about how it should be interpreted. If you are going to carry a gun, you need to understand what the use of force continuum is. You need to be able to assess a situation. I don't mean training by the government. The government doesn't give this kind of training. I mean going to the range, people taking classes, people watching self-defense videos. He said that he feels Foster's death was a tragedy, but thinks Foster may have instigated the situation when he approached the oncoming car, which there's it doesn't apparently be to dispute that he is the one that approached the car and asked where all those went down. Mm-hmm. So I tend to agree with the assessment by uh, Mr. Gresham. Uh, this isn't just an issue of open carry. If Garrett was just walking down the street, this wouldn't have been the same issue. A smart, trained gun owner would have known you don't take a gun into a situation like that. No kidding. He added, if your life is not in danger, you have no reason for having that gun in your hand whatsoever. The sole purpose of a gun is self-defense and prevention of crime. Criminal defense attorney Steve Tolan said Texas is a stand-your-ground state, but just but just defined self-defense can be complicated, just as we were talking about earlier. It's it's really, and I've learned this, and, and you may have too in our criminal cases, uh, although the, the standard is um, beyond a reasonable doubt, I have found that it is guilty and to prove an innocent with juries over 50% of the time. So it's really difficult. And so you've got... Either way, it's you've got an uphill battle, and so take your fifth and don't be just speaking your mind to to somebody, um, uh, to anybody on the street until you've talked with an attorney first, mm-hmm. um, because the Fifth Amendment is whatever has whatever you say can and will be held against you, and if you say something, you're not entitled to Miranda rights if you're not. Um, in custody, mm-hmm. which means you're free to go. Mm-hmm. It happens all the time. People just blurt something out mm-hmm. and. They're volunteering something that's going to be held against them mm-hmm. any way it comes out. Mm-hmm. So be really careful about that. Stand your ground laws in Texas allow individuals to use force to defend themselves without first attempting to retreat from the danger. Mm-hmm. That's very important because this, as you, we said earlier, uh, many states don't have uh, stand your ground. You don't you don't have that They've right. They've got the duty to retreat. Right, and in Texas you don't. You don't have to retreat, particularly if you're in your house, your car, and. Um, Gosh, there's one other place. But pr- pr- primarily the Castle Doctrine, your house, mm-hmm, your home. Mm-hmm. Um, your own home. You can't be the instigator, Tolan explains. Also noting someone can only justifiably respond with the same amount of force that's being used against them. So you can't shoot somebody that comes to your house if they're, they only have a knife, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're pretty far away from you. That, that doesn't, that's not going to be reasonable either. He added that a car can be used as a deadly weapon. So on the other hand... A car, I've had many, many cases where there's a fight between uh, husband and wife, spouse, ex, estranged, whatever, and the car is deemed deadly weapon because they said, oh, I thought he was going to hit me with it. He bumped me. A car is a deadly weapon, but in this instance, he, if he worked, if he can prove he worked for rideshare and they just somebody, dropped someone off at the record show that he was just doing his job, then more than likely it was not a deadly weapon in that instance. Um, someone accelerating with force, uh, they are going through a, someone accelerating with force they're going through a crowd that's a very different situation where someone might be justified at pointing a fire gun at a moving car so just like you saw like in new orleans and several other places where someone has crashed through a crowd and that's a deadly weapon this is not what they said what happened in this place they said this guy was just slowly moving through the crowd tellen said the unique facts of each case matter and that's very true every case is completely different when it comes to the decision to press charges like whether the road was open and the light was green and i'm going to add whether uh, the prosecutor and the uh, the mayor are, you know, aligned with the protesters or not. Right. Makes a big, big difference on whether they're going to press charges. Uh, just weeks ago, a protester in Seattle was killed when a man who drove his car onto a closed freeway and into a crowd protesting police brutality. Um, and I don't know what happened with that case, but I remember seeing it. According to the Austin Police Department, the driver was traveling legally in a moving lane of traffic on 8th Street when he was approached by, quote, an aggressive crowd who surrounded the vehicle and started banging on his windows. That's pretty fearful. Yeah. Um, according to... Um, That's crazy. That sounds like Iraq or something. Yeah, that does sound just really crazy. That is Austin. This is like... I know. Where UT, this is where our kids go to school. Yeah. Nobody cares about stuff in Austin. Yeah. <laughs> Except for letting their They're dogs like, oh. into a restaurant to eat and drink right. on the patio, you know, whatever. Right. Um, uh, Austin's uh, police department statement went on to say, quote, fearing for his life, the driver brandished a legally carried weapon. 
Um, Tolan said self-defense cases can be difficult because of a lack of clarity in many incidents. You have to remember that the burden of the person who used force are deadly force. So the burden is on the guy that, that killed uh, Garrett Foster. Mm -hmm. You have a burden of proof. You have to justify why you did that. So um, this is just a difficult situation, but it sounds to me like it may have been very well. His affirmative defense is self-defense. I did it, but I did it in self-defense. Um, on Monday, the Austin Police Department released new videos of the fatal Mike Ramo shooting in April after months of increased push for their availability. Um, in a 60-minute video showing the moments before, 42-year-old Ramos was fatally shot by an Austin police officer, Christopher Taylor, during an incident in southeast Austin. The shooting occurred after the police responded to a report that a man in a car was waving a gun in the air. Um, and this is just one more example of somebody with a gun that is in Austin that someone got hurt. The video release comes amid a nationwide wave of demands for police reform and increased accountability during deadly law enforcement events, including the global impact of the George Floyd arrest video. More regionally, the, the shootings of Ramos and the in-custody death of Javier Ambler have remained a subject of protest and calls for justice. Um, how the dead sus quote dead suspect loophole kept information about Javier Ambler's death in the dark. I don't know. They, they don't go on to talk about the hair in this article. But how does the release of video such as the Ramos footage impact transparency in law enforcement overall? Mm -hmm. um, it does. They waited a long time to do it, and they don't have to release videos, but sometimes it's in their best interest to calm the press down, I think, and the public at large, because it does look pretty bad if the police are shooting somebody that may be um, having a mental health issue and i've just got a call on that the other day so true. um the you've got mental health cases and you're trying to um get this person to be declared incapacitated so you can get them into uh an, uh, a mental health place uh, mm -hmm. not voluntarily mm -hmm. but not through the government intervention where mm -hmm. they're they're held against their will mm -hmm. uh, because they're doing crazy things because they're not mentally stable they're not mm -hmm. on the right medication mm -hmm. so all of this comes into play and it's really really sad and mm -hmm. you know it's it's in those situations where you don't want you do want strong laws for the people that have mental health issues mm -hmm. not to have guns. Mm -hmm. That needs to be vetted much more closely. I don't mm -hmm. know if it is. I don't know enough about the laws right now. But I think we had a show where uh, they do vet it, but they can't. You don't know when somebody that's mentally unstable can act, get access to a gun, and it wasn't through legal means. And then they so true. get themselves in trouble again. Mm -hmm. um, University of Texas law professor Jennifer Lawrence says this kind of footage can foster community trust, but it can also bring a new level of scrutiny. Um, the, uh, there's going to be a predictability, predictably less trust, less willingness to take police at their word. I do think it's important to say that there are some legitimate privacy interests in, from any governmental organization um, has to account for when they release public information. And these things during uh, these open cases, it's completely up to the prosecutor if they want to release it because it's not up to the defense attorney. Um, in many cases, I've had true police brutality, not just... And the, knowing when something's police brutality and when uh, and when it's not, when the police are doing their job, mm -hmm. it, there's a fine dividing line. But it's he said, she said, until you look at everything. And I've had I've had true cases of police brutality where they've beaten the pulp out of my client for no reason whatsoever, other than they just could. And you're not allowed as a defense attorney to release that to the press during the uh, pendency of the case because you sign off saying that this is discovery unless you can get the permission of the police and uh, or the prosecutor and they're not going to give you that if they're no. in the wrong right. so you can only do that after it's released and a lot of times if you make a plea deal because your guy may have had some mental health issues like mm -hmm. in this particular case it did too mm -hmm. and you don't want their information to get out then you have to make a plea deal and then it gets covered and so it's just it's really bad you don't see a lot of the things that are going on but I would say that in my own experience, 95% of the time, the police are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. That, um, And another 5%, you've got those bad apples that, mm -hmm. just like you do in every organization, mm -hmm. that are doing completely the wrong thing, and there should be justice, but it's mm -hmm. really difficult. Um, the uh, Let's see. Uh, Lauren says, efforts to increase transparency uh, may have already been in the works before the Ramos footage, she says the possibility of proposed legislation will be very interesting uh, to see in addition to how it will receive in the current political winds. The Freedom of Information Foundation of Texas has already been working with law with state lawmakers on legislation surrounding transparency with regard to law enforcement. So they may be trying to change that rule that uh, prevents um, criminal defense attorneys from from you know putting out information that um, that shows what's really going on. Now, um, 
with regard to this, um, you know, this, this article goes on and on, and it, it kind of goes into different directions. But but we were really looking at a uh, stand your ground and what your rights are as um, as citizens in Montgomery County and in Conroe, right. uh, in the general area. When just like with this couple in St. Louis, unlike driving into a crowd unbeknownst to you, where uh, it's a protest and it's just an, an, a, a tragic situation, what about when you're at home? What about when you have that couple like in Houston that? didn't have any drugs in their home and the search warrant was improperly uh, obtained Terrible. and that they were killed when they answered the door and then they, the police lied and said that they had a gun and there was no gun, there was no drugs, uh, just a, a small amount, but nothing that would have been something right. to bust them down and lose their lives over. And, um, you know, what that's escalated to is that we've had the, the detective that got the search warrant, he has now been indicted mm -hmm. and all the cases that he was involved with were dismissed. Right. Lucky for those other people that really were criminals. Mm -hmm. And um, so what do you do when someone comes to your door Mm -hmm. and they say they're a police officer, whether they are or not, or you feel threatened when someone comes to your home. So we're going to go over that a little bit today. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of leads to the questions that we had last week before mm -hmm. we get into mm -hmm. some other uh, issues. Um, before we get to those questions, I just want to tell our listeners that 15 states impose a duty to retreat, what mm -hmm. you've just been talking about, when one can do so with absolute safety. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting. Those states are Arkansas, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Nebraska, New Jersey, New York, North Dakota, Ohio, Rhode Island, and Wisconsin. New York, however, does not require retreat when one is threatened with robbery, burglary, kidnapping, or sexual assault. So I think that that's interesting. But that's good to know. It, it, Arkansas is our only contiguous state, right? Uh -huh, yeah. In that list. Yeah. So people, when you go over into Arkansas, just yeah. know that the laws have changed. But you don't have a duty retreat in Louisiana, New Mexico. Uh, I think all the, the, the Gulf Coast states. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Maybe it has to do with pirates and Gene Lafitte. 35 <laughs> states have stand your ground. And um, you don't have you can you don't have to. You could basically you don't have a duty to run. Uh, away from it or to get away if you could right like someone's at your door you slam the door and run yeah. you could just shoot them on site if they're holding a gun at you yeah um and, and i hope someone doesn't come to your home but it happens Me too. You, you, we, we, we have we've seen all this we've seen i think we've seen so much even in our short lives i'm sure there's we should have somebody on that's like 70 or 80 that's been Telling through us even what more they've seen. Yeah. Or, or maybe even when we have um district attorney brett lignan uh -huh. on and he if can we can get more. him on here. He's going DA. to come on. We're, yeah, we're, uh, yeah. He's come on to other shows. I'm sure we can get him on. We just have to catch him when he's got the time to do it. And uh -huh. he will be our guest. And we're going to ask him all about that. Okay, so um, here was a scenario. It's going to give you food for thought. Um, and and uh, we, we stopped short of this in our last show. And it was really important that we be able to answer this for our, our listeners because um, I think it will give us, you know, uh, a good direction on the spur of the moment thought process, right? Okay. Um, it's midnight and you awaken to strange sounds somewhere outside the front of your home. You get out of bed, grab your firearm, run to the front window and look outside. That would be a very typical scenario. Sure. I can see Jim doing that in a second because mm -hmm. we have, you know, our handguns real close at hand because you don't know who's going to come onto your property and, mm -hmm. uh, and try to rip you off. Yeah. It happens all the time, right? Mm -hmm. well, I hope it doesn't happen all the time, but when when these incidents occur, people are looking to burglarize. The, it's going to be at night generally. That's when most of the burglars are at occur, home in bed. Are, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, they don't know where your bedroom is necessarily. I, I wouldn't think that we've had anybody in our house that would know our layout. But anyway, um, that's when you see a masked man in your front yard peeking into your car, looking around for security cameras. Now that you see a lot, people that are looking just to vandalize cars, steal, steal radios, what maybe you may have left in your car. And so you see somebody kind of pirating around, peeking in, right? Right. Um, what can you legally do to stop him? Do you, have, do you have to let him steal your property? You're watching this guy looking at your car. Now, the, the, the flip side of that is what if it's one of your kids? What if it's they just left something in the car? What if it's uh, a neighbor that's drunk? And you drunk? don't have your contacts on in the middle of the night right. or a neighbor that's drunk. Right. That's very common. Right, right. Made a mistake. Right. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can happen. And they maybe you've got a lot of cars in your street and... Uh, yeah, somebody's just walking down the street. They went to the wrong car. It looks just I've done that before in the parking lot. I've oh, yeah. literally walked up and put my keys in the car because it's not opening with the little clicker in all frustration only to realize that I'm the parked a few car. places over and I'm breaking into someone's car. I know. I've kind of been shot. It's Home Depot. Nobody shoots anybody <laughs> there. Um, 
let's change it up a bit. What if the sound turns out to be broken glass from your front door and you walk into your living room only to discover your front door is wide open? You hear someone moving in the next room and you know your wife and child are still in bed and asleep. What do you do? Now, I, I watched a, a Texas show on where this occurred and it was another um, teenage son of the family that I believe got killed. Was so he they, on drugs and um, broke the front he, door? He didn't live there. He was just visiting and he just came in. He was at home and he just didn't tell his parents he was visiting. He came in, but there, it wasn't, there wasn't breaking glass, but he came in and he was shot by his father because oh, his good. father didn't know it was, was him. Was he killed? Yeah, I Aww. believe he was killed. Uh, but it's a sad situation. So you got to be careful. You can't be trigger happy, no. but you also need to protect yourself. But you know, that's when I say use your wasp spray. <laughs> your wasp spray. I yeah. say, well, you know, to, to maim them and blind them uh, mm-hmm. so that you're not killing maybe a relative that you'll, you know, regret for the rest of your life. Um, uh, these are very frightening scenarios we hope you'll never face, but we have, um, but we want you to understand that the potential criminal consequences that you, as a responsible gun owner, could face if you use force or deadly force to defend against certain types of crimes involving property. Remember, many states strictly forbid the use of deadly force to protect your property. And the 15 uh, non-retreat mm-hmm. states we just mm-hmm. mentioned, mm-hmm. Arkansas being the one that's right next to us, mm-hmm. um, are contiguous to Texas. Now, criminal consequences. Let to look at the potential criminal consequences you face if you decide to confront these types of perpetra- perpetrators with force or deadly force. And this would be your home or your car. Your because property. You're, because that is your, that's the castle ground. Right. So the same thing would apply to the guy that we just talked about that was in his car if he felt threatened. Okay. The, the penal code that you need to look at is Texas Penal Code Section 9.41. It's uh, fairly lengthy, and it's got some definitions above that. But if you want to have the actual law, not just rely upon us, go to, you can just Google Texas Penal Code Section 941. It explains that a person is allowed to use force, but not deadly force, to terminate a mere trespass or interference with property. So you can use force, but not deadly force. And that's I mean, that's pretty, if you're a bad shot, it could be deadly force. Mm -hmm. That's where I, once again, I go to wasp spray or if they're outside your house calling the police. Mm -hmm. If you've got security cameras, which I believe everybody should these days, they're really, it's really inexpensive in the big scheme of things just to have security cameras up in front of your house so you can Mm -hmm. catch them later. But you're still inside your house and so you're still safe, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I do, I remember taking on a case, um, well, two different ones I'm thinking of right now where, there was a dating situation where it was still bad because my clients were had met these these girls on um, a dating site where they had to be 18, but the girls were not. They were 12, 13, and 14, Ooh. and they were little Lolitas, but they presented themselves as 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. And with makeup on, they looked like that. They were very scantily clad. They looked old enough to be... Um, to have been that age, but they were lying. And these, these girls were beckoning these guys into their bedroom windows. Uh, and the father uh, accosted one of these guys that was my client at the time. And the guy was like, look, I called her. Here's my records. This is what she told me. This is what she looked like. And everything supported what he told me, this little Lolita. And so kids with young girls that are 12, 13, 14, don't believe for a second that they're that innocent. It could very well be that they're beckoning the the danger to your house. And there are, you know, this is a bunny trail, but there are scams that go on along those lines too. <clears throat> the families get involved and then they start blackmailing the person that broke the law right, uh, right. over their little 12, 13-year-old right, right. daughter and to the, get they're money really from bad, them. really bad, these little Lolita. And so no. you, you can't just take things at face value. Every case is completely different. But this guy got, my client was beaten nearly to death by the father and the brother, while little Lolita was like, I don't know who they are, until we got all the information to support it. And then she later on, I learned, got pregnant by another guy, probably another guy. She was only doing it because she wanted these guys that she was meeting to buy her stuff at the mall. Mm-hmm. And they were buying her all kind of stuff. So she was just a a very young hooker, basically, and very worldly for, mm-hmm. she had just turned 13. It was really bad. But uh, that should be a word to the wise of people. Don't be crawling into the windows of potential dates because it, it may be a scam. You don't and then, know who they and are. And you right. may get killed by the actual homeowner. Mm-hmm. So do your homework and don't mm-hmm. be doing that. Meet them at a restaurant or mm-hmm. take them out or meet their dad first, whatever. Okay, so the law says um, trespass occurs when a person enters onto or into property knowing that the entry is forbidden which my guy didn't know at the time. He was being invited by a person that lived there or remains on the property after being told to leave by someone with authority. And you see these examples like when people get stuck in Target 
uh, are, you know, the, the store is closing and they stay and they're locked in and you're like, that could never happen. Well, it does actually happen where mm-hmm. people are like mm-hmm. in there and they haven't asked to leave and they know they shouldn't be there, but they're kind of stuck. And then the security guard shows up and it's like, you've been trespassing. And that's just a really mild example. But um, if somebody asks you to leave, let's say it's your estranged wife, she invites you over, our date invites you over, and you're invited over and then they've changed their mind. You need to leave. And this happens a lot in my family assaults. And you're like, no, I'm not going to leave because you have my phone and my stuff is here and my kids are here and you don't leave well you are trespassing if it's there they have a higher right than you to be there Mm -hmm. um if there's some kind of order there's no orders then it's a he said she said if you both own the property whatever but but if someone asks you to leave i'd say it's probably just in your best interest to leave your phone and go and then turn it off so that they can't get into your that just adds to more problems because usually they want your phone because you've got some stuff in there that shows you're cheating and stuff like that so uh, just leave and then get your phone disconnected um Theft or, uh, theft or interference with property occurs when a person takes another person's property with the intent to deprive them of that property and without the owner's consent. And there's also a gray area in this here, too, because the person may be believing that they're buying property and it's being sold on these these websites that they, they're buying, selling property, and they don't even know they're buying that. So it could be that they don't know. And I'm being told that yeah, our, we're out of time. our show is already out of time before we got to this, and so we're going to have to tell you what your rights are in this scenario on our next show. That's right. Thanks for listening, guys. You can uh, listen to the uh, podcast, Google Play or iTunes tomorrow. You can download it. We want to remind you to serve God by serving others. Have a great week. Today's show was recorded and broadcasted live on IRLoneStar.com, Conroe's FM 104.5, 106.1, and all rights and ownership are reserved to Lone Star Community Radio. For more information regarding this program and Lone Star Community Radio, visit us online at IRLoneStar.com. Lone Star Community Radio is Montgomery County's community radio station, serving the community with local programming on TV, radio, and online. If you enjoyed today's program, please support us by sponsorship or starting your own show. Contact us today by phone or text at 936-666-1084 or email the station at lscrstudios at gmail.com.